Good morning, sir. Good morning, Akansha. Uh, sir, Rahul sir is also here, sir. Uh, we are just waiting for a few more minutes to everybody to join in, sir. Right. Good morning, architect Rahul. Yeah. <clears throat> Akanksha, tell the students to notify their friends hmm, so that they join quickly. Yes, sir. I'm doing that. I think three more have to join. Yes, sir.
sir. I think we can start the meeting, sir. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Assistant Professor Akanksha. Would like to welcome you all to Geetam School of Architecture Webinar 2023 on the theme Auditorium and Performing Space Design that has been organized by Geetam School of Architecture, Hyderabad, Vishakhapatnam for the students of architecture. Architect Rahul Manohar is uh, leading the webinar today. So I would like to introduce you to Professor Sunil Kumar Ji, Director of Geetam School of Architecture, Hyderabad, and would like to request her to share a few words with us. Yeah, yeah Rahul, thank you so much for being here on this platform again. Uh, My pleasure. You, yeah, you actually <clears throat> took a class for our senior batch students and, uh, we, and we were very happy with that session. And uh, yeah. so I, in fact, asked Akanksha, please contact and uh, see that this mm -hmm. session happens. Uh, yeah. This batch is 11 students, Rahul, actually. Okay. And so Akanksha is uh, taking the acoustics um, uh, theory classes. So I wanted uh your session so that you know, the students will get an overview of the kind of work that is happening uh, with respect to, to auditoriums yeah. because it's yeah. a very niche uh, area correct and um, uh, even for case studies also you don't get uh, much <laughs> True. Uh, chance to go and do a case study True. because all the time you no, know, the institutions are very Typical to show them, and even then, if they show, they just open the doors, and the student will not be able to understand much. In fact, yeah. we are lucky that we have a we have four, three, four types of auditoriums in our working them on a case study for all those. So she shown them the electronic systems and all that. Correct. But your experience and the way you have done the work, it's a great work. So I want our students to get exposed to that, that kind of work and see uh, how the big scope is in auditorium design. It's, it's, it's itself a specialty job for an architect. And I'm lucky True. that you have done such wonderful works. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah. Incidentally, I don't, I, don't know, I don't know whether you're aware, but I had actually visited your uh, Hyderabad campus auditorium also before it was constructed. So yes, you I told me that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was called over there, but for some reason, uh, it didn't work out. So yes. uh, can we start with the presentation then? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, sir, so just much. allow me for a quick yeah. introduction, then we can sure. start with the presentation. Sure, sure. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, sir, uh, Sunil, sir, for this introduction. Uh, so it is time for us to introduce our uh, architect Rahul Manohar, who is the today's presenter. So, uh, RRM Design has been founded by architect Rahul Manohar, who has been practicing from Mumbai since 1993. And he has had the privilege and honor to have been mentored by the late master architect Drusam uh, B.G. Patel, uh, who is a senior partner with the Patel, Patliwala, Manohar and Associates and fellow of the Frank Lloyd Wright Foundation USA. He has also been fortunate to have been guided by his father, late architect, architect uh, Mr. Madhav S. Manoha, to tackle the intricacies of project management, local authority regulations, and client interaction. Some of the projects covered here include uh, those handled by architect Rahul Manoha and Madhav Manoha from 1958 to 2015 when they were with the Patel, Bhatliwala, Manohan and Associates. Now I invite uh, architect Rahul to talk about himself and his projects that we were so eagerly waiting for. The platform is all yours, sir. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Akanksha. Uh, uh, I mean, besides the introduction that uh, uh, Akanksha has been very kind enough to give, uh, what we have been fortunate enough over the years is... Uh, uh, having had the opportunity to work with not just uh, very interesting projects, but with very supporting clients, because any any architect will tell you that uh, half the part of the battle is getting a good client. And uh, fortunately, we have uh, been associated with clients like the House of Tatars. We have done a lot of work with the Godrej Group uh, and many of the other top corporates where we got a lot of uh, not just backing, 
but uh, uh, as uh, uh, professor sunil kumar said that uh, uh, this segment is such that unless you have a proper technical uh, kind of you know understanding of the subject even for architects uh, who have got uh, you know 20 30 years experience sometimes it becomes a difficult proposition because it's it's a very niche kind of a segment and uh, we were fortunate in our kind of formative years so to speak when we started designing auditoriums in the late 60s uh, when obviously my dad was uh, involved in in uh, the design part of it uh, to be exposed to a lot of foreign consultants also so that is where we actually learned a lot from uh, uh, many of the consultants from the US and Europe uh, about the basics of acoustics. Now, of course, over the years, there's been a lot of changes with new technologies coming in, so on and so forth. But uh, having that basic knowledge from uh, someone who is well-versed and experienced, especially because in India, unfortunately, at that time, the awareness, awareness was even less. Even now, the awareness is not as much. So a lot of the auditoriums that you all see designed today, unfortunately, have not been designed to their full potential. So we've been fortunate and uh, we've had uh, supportive clients. We've been fortunate enough to work with uh, very good consultants because uh, as with any any complex projects, it's always a team effort. So though, you know, the architect is, is called the captain of the ship, but eventually you need uh, good consultants to support your team. And we've been fortunate to have that also. Uh, so for specifically for auditoriums, we uh, started uh, work initially uh, uh, with NCPA, which is a big complex in Mumbai, where we were fortunate to work with uh, Professor Cyril Harris, who is supposed to be the father of modern acoustics. So not too many people get a chance to work with some someone like him. So that was our uh, one of our uh, you know key factors in in enriching our knowledge. Then uh, when we continued our practice in India, we were associated with consultants like Jal Mistri and Barjor Mistri, who were at that time supposed to be one of the leading consultants in the country. Uh, then until recently, we used to work with one Dr. Raj Gopalan, who is uh, Nagpur based, who uh, at the moment I would say is one of the senior most uh, acoustical consultants in the country. And we are now currently working with many of the younger uh, consultants also like Monroe consultants and some of the other consultants. So a uh, lot of the projects that you see, uh, though we have been the lead architects, a lot of credit should go to a lot of these other consultants who have also helped us in the process. So without uh, taking more time, I'll just um, uh, start with the presentation and then I'll give you further details as we move on. You can see the screen, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes, okay. sir. So uh, basically what we do uh, when we give this kind of a presentation uh, to colleges is that we try and cover all aspects of uh, auditorium and, uh, you know, seminar hall and all these kind of structure designing. Uh, so that as students, when you all step into the industry, uh, you all should be only the explore screen, sir, not the presentation. Oh, you cannot see the presentation. Yeah, it's only the explore uh, screen that we are seeing. Yeah, no, yes. Can you all see now? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Now it's visible. So we basically divide uh, the presentation, as you see over here, into four aspects. Uh, one, we take you through some of our completed projects to help the students understand uh, what went into the design, what was the design philosophy, what were the uh, restrictions, what were the different kind of materials used, uh, and eventually, obviously, what the end product looked like. Uh, the second, uh, uh, sorry, the second session is where we, uh, second section is where we uh, explore some of our unbuilt projects where or under construction also so you get a better idea of how things uh, kind of evolve during construction what are the various phases of construction how the site looks during construction compared to how it looks as a completed project uh, the third part is we uh, take you through the basic design parameters 
not just architectural design, but uh, design of all disciplines. So whether it is structure, whether it is electrical, whether it's air conditioning or any of the other disciplines with the idea that as architects, even though our core competence is obviously architectural designing, but we need to have uh, to, to kind of have a sufficient know-how on all the other aspects of the structure also if we uh, want to have a good command over the entire design process. Many a times in today's day and age, what we find is a lot of architects are not very versed with either structures or with uh, services or with materials because of which sometimes, uh, you know, the other consultants kind of uh, overrule your judgment, which should not ideally happen. So you should not, it's, I'm not saying you should know everything about, you know, all the details of all structure and services, but you need to know enough that if you see there is a potential or you see there is a better possibility, you should be able to tell your consultant that why don't you explore further and, you know, figure out if we can work out or the, or the solution in this manner. At least you should, you need to have that much of knowledge and confidence. And the fourth part of the presentation obviously would be newer technologies uh, where we are working with some, uh, one of the international firms in trying to get some new technologies into India. So we'll try and touch upon that. So we all are well versed with what is happen, uh, happening currently into the market. So moving to the first section, uh, we'll start with a short video of uh, one of our auditoriums, which we recently completed in uh, Kochi. This is a 2,500 seater auditorium for uh, educational campus called Rajagiri Educational Campus. So it's a very short video. We'll see that and then we can move on. The reason I'm showing you the video is you understand better when it's a video compared to just photos. So we'll start off with that first. So uh, one of the key uh, reasons why we start off uh, with this auditorium is it, it has a lot of unique features compared to many of the auditoriums that we have done. Uh, one of the major features that uh, you don't actually realize seeing the video or seeing any of these photographs is that the auditorium is actually on the top part of this seven story building. So this is a 2,500 capacity auditorium and probably the only auditorium in India which has such a large capacity and is actually located on the top of a building. Uh, whereas most uh, such large capacity auditoriums, you'll usually find them on the ground level. Uh, one of the reasons why uh, this kind of a design was done is we were actually uh, designing this entire block, uh, academic block for this particular uh, institute. And the original design for this auditorium was for only 300 seats with the idea being that this would be their corporate auditorium. Corporate in the sense only meant for their top management and you know events which are specifically for their top management and uh, senior faculty. Uh, but what happened is once the construction started, uh, there was a request that whether uh, we could build a larger auditorium because they realized that they don't have a large auditorium for their entire campus because they have various disciplines. They have science, they have engineering, they have MBA and a lot of other programs that they hold in the campus. So they wanted a kind of a common auditorium for their entire campus. Now the challenge here was that we, uh, th there was no space open, uh, adequate open space available in the campus for su such a large auditorium. So they asked us to explore whether the same auditorium can be enlarged. 
Now, one of the challenges was that we actually had a central atrium in this building with a skylight. So what we did is that we kind of bridged over the atrium and we extend the building on all three sides because that was the only way we could fit in. They actually wanted 3000 capacity, but we managed to get about 2500. So what was done over here is after the building construction was done up to about third or fourth floor, we actually uh, increased the building footprint right from the ground level by having additional columns to accommodate the extra floor plate that was required for the auditorium. So there are a lot of complicated structural uh, design decisions had to be taken. A lot of architectural replanning had to be done. There's a large area at the back which we wanted to use as a main foyer where originally there were a lot of classrooms and uh, you know typical academic kind of a subdivision of that area. So then we, we told them that if you want such a big auditorium, you'll need to give us this entire back area as a big foyer area because for such a large auditorium, you need that kind of foyer space not just for people to kind of, you know, use during the interval or before and after an event, but even from terms of a fire uh, exit or emergency exit point of view, you need that much of fire area to support the capacity. Other challenges obviously were uh, to have as many fire exits as were required as per norm. So we had to add elevators, we had to add staircases. So two staircases, what you see over here with a glass facade, these two staircases were added later on. So very complicated project. And uh, what you will see here now in the interior, which obviously you don't realize what has happened in the exterior, are the various components. So one of the requirements which governed our overall design and material selection was being an institutional auditorium, they wanted to use materials which would have very minimal uh, kind of maintenance uh, requirement because uh, such auditoriums typically don't have professional housekeeping staff like commercial auditoriums. So, you know, they didn't want to spend much on uh, material maintenance. So what you see over here at a lot of places which may look like wood or which may look like some uh, other material uh, is actually aluminum and various ways in which aluminum has been used. So if you see over here, all this wall paneling is aluminum, the ceiling paneling over here is aluminum. Even the wooden kind of a look you see over here, even that is actually aluminum with micro perforations. The other thing that we have incorporated over here is this dark band which you see here is what is known as a light bridge. Now this light bridge is needed for light, a specific kind of lighting which is known as FOH lighting. So FOH stands for front of house where these uh, lights are actually what are used to light up the occupants on the stage because the other lights which are on the top of the stage, their angle is too acute. So that doesn't light up the front of the body of the you know people, whether the actors or whoever is there on stage. So you need these lights in the auditorium uh, in the auditorium seating area to get the correct angle to light up the people. So this is what is known as a light bridge. Now, typically in many auditoriums, you won't find a light bridge like this. You will just find a bar over here with lights over there. So that is also that can also be done. But there are two disadvantages to it. One is that it aesthetically doesn't look very, very nice because you just see a, you know, a bar with kind of suspended lights. Uh, and then that bar has to be motorized because if you need to access that bar, uh, you need to lower it over here and, you know, change the location of the light fittings and then again, raise it up. So here the advantage is this, there is actually an entire walkway at the back over here. And then the continuous bar, which is here, the lights can be adjusted anywhere along the length of this bar. So you get much more flexibility. Plus you can actually have your technician sitting behind and doing finer adjustments when uh, your show or the event is uh, going on. So it's always nicer to have a dedicated light bridge. The only reason why you can't is if, if there is just no headroom or there is some restriction of uh, you know uh, height available, then there is no choice. Then you can go in for a kind of an exposed light bar. What you see here, these baffles, these are also in aluminum. And there is a darker ceiling above which has got all the AC vents and sprinklers and so on and so forth. Uh, these are obviously the main speakers, which are known as array speakers. Uh, 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 the lower level finishing, what you see is uh, HDF boards with uh, laminate finish, which again is easier to maintain. Uh, flooring is a mix of carpet and vinyl. So they didn't want to kind of have the entire floor as carpet because again, it becomes difficult to maintain. So where the seating area is, we have got vinyl flooring and the aisles and the cross aisles, both are, uh, both have got carpet. Uh, you can see here, because this was a change of kind of, you know, capacity in the auditorium, we couldn't kind of give it the ideal 
uh, kind of uh, facilities that this uh, auditorium of this scale should have. That's why the side stage areas where you see, I've got a very little height. So the site is just enough for humans to kind of, you know, go in and come out. You can't have like large props or you can't have big scenery coming in from the side. So that was a big restriction, but that they were okay with it. So, you know, we, this, this is not an ideal kind of a design. Even the slot which you, you see here are, are for the lights which are on the side, which normally is not done this way. Normally you have wings, which you'll see in the other auditoriums, which I'll show you. So you have side wings over here and you've got light slots in between the side wings to get light from the side of the stage for certain light effects for certain uh, kind of uh, uh, events. But the structural system over here again was interesting because for such a large span, the only structural system that our consultant could come up with was actually a space frame. So normally a space frame uh, design is done at a place where you can see the space frame. That is the whole idea of behind having a space frame. So here also, uh, I mean, this is one of the photos, the space frame uh, design I'll show you in the next slide. What is interesting over here, if you can notice is that all these aisles, we have managed to maintain a, a straight geometry, even though in plan, all these seats are radial. So typically when you have a radial arrangement, you tend to get a zigzag kind of a profile of the seats along the aisle. So what we have done over here is in each seating segment, we have got three different widths of chairs, which you can't make out visually. So there is a slight variation from varying from 535 to about 575 mm center to center. The reason behind that is we have adjusted these rows in such a way that somewhere in between one or two seats are larger or smaller so that we get out absolutely straight line at the end of the eye. Now, this is purely a aesthetic kind of a requirement, but a lot of auditoriums you find that this is not done. In fact, some of our other auditoriums, which you'll see going forward, you won't find this. So here we made it a point that, you know, even though it was a radial arrangement, all the aisles are perfectly aligned geometrically. So here you actually, above this, you can see the space frame over here. So one of the first things that we tried to tackle over here was since we had a space frame on top, our first few designs of op design options, we actually explored uh, exposing the space frame in the seating area, which would have been a novel kind of a architectural concept. But we found it very difficult because to manage the acoustics in that kind of a structure was becoming very difficult. So eventually we had to give up and give up the idea and then we basically covered the entire space frame with a fall ceiling which were not, not a very happy solution, but unfortunately we didn't have much of a choice. Uh, other interesting thing over here is you see the entire stage rigging mechanism as it is called. So these are various bars. What you see here is what is known as a utility bar. So you'll see there is nothing on this bar. So you can actually have uh, some kind of a scenery which is uh, fixed onto this bar, or you can have some kind of a prop which is fixed here, which can go up and down. And these bars are typically called as light bars. So obviously you have your light fittings, different kind of light fittings. You have spotlights, uh, you have park ends, you have uh, uh, what are known as cool lights. Sometimes if this bar is closer to the back, the back is usually called as cyclorama. So you have cyclorama lights over there also on the bar. So you can get different kind of light washes on the as a background for an event. What you see over here as cutouts are for what are known as fill speakers. So typically, depending on how big and how your seating area is proportioned, uh, your audio video consultant will tell you whether these main speakers, which are known as arrays, are sufficient for uniform uh, sound dispersal, or do you need some kind of a additional speaker arrangement? So in our case, what happened is because it was 2,500 seats and 2,500 seats in one slope, there was no balcony because we were governed by the NBC ruling where you cannot have a, a building height of more than 30 meters. So we couldn't have a balcony here. So this was a very unique kind of a very narrow uh, volume which was stretching far into the seating area. So these array speakers could, did not have enough throw to reach the back. So what uh, the way the sound disposal is designed that the arrays uh, kind of, you know, cover the central uh, portion, the majority central portion of the seating area. And for the front portion, you have these front fills, which, which support the arrays. And for the rear portion, you have rear fills or rear speakers, which kind of cover the rear rows, which also you'll see in the other photographs. Uh, on the left over here, what you see is uh, the chair bracket. So what I told you earlier about the way the chair fixing arrangement was done, it's ac actually this bracket fixing, which is very critical, which becomes a skilled job 
and once the brackets are fixed in the proper location then obviously the chair fixing is just a kind of you know manual work after that nothing too skilled about it uh, this is again where you see the space frame more clearly this is the area above the uh, stage which normally you all don't get to see so what you see over here is a square grid i don't know whether it's clear but this is an approximate 2 meter by 2 meter square grid which is known as a c grid so what the stage equipment vendor does is they erect this uh, c grid uh, just below your structural ceiling and the entire all these lighting bars scenery bars or whatever other utility bars you have above the stage are suspended from this secondary c grid they are not suspended from the true ceiling so you always have this c grid and the other advantage of a c grid is what you see over here is you can have a grating on top of the c grid so it becomes like a maintenance platform because since all these bars are motorized all their motors are what you see over here all these they are the motors so the motors are fix, are kind of placed on top of this c grid so we make a, temp, a part of the c grid can be converted into a maintenance platform where these motors can be kind of you know maintained from time to time by coming up and the technicians can access this area uh, what you see on the right top right over here is another interesting design uh, uh, idea that we have used over here because again this auditorium was originally not planned at this location we did not have any kind of space to accommodate ahus so typically in such auditoriums you have ahus maybe 2 3 4 depending on how, how you are uh, you know the distribution of your air conditioning system is done but here since there was no space for providing any ahus within the building we have used what is known as a combination package unit system so what happens in in this system is you basically need some outdoor space either on a terrace as you have seen over here or it can even be on the ground somewhere where you have these combination package units now the why it is called combination packages this is what your uh, indoor and outdoor unit is combined over here there is no separate indoor there is no separate outdoor unit so what you have from this unit is you have these ducts which get in the supplier ducts which get into your interior and they kind of you know they are rooted within your interior and the return air is also taken in by an independent duct which you can't see here it's at the side over here and it is taken back into this equipment so there is basically no ahu anywhere inside the building the only ac equipment that you have is outside and what you have inside is only the ducts running the other thing that you need to be aware is in the air conditioning system because this is a large volume space and a lot of people kind of congregate here at the same time Uh, uh exhausting of the return air becomes very critical so normally uh, return air needs to be exhausted because if there is an emergency like a fire you must have read in a lot of uh, you know newspaper reports and online reports that majority of the casualties are because of the smoke and not because of the actual fire so what is important is how fast you can exhaust the smoke in case of a fire so normally what is done is you can have a separate exhaust ducting as it is called which you many a times may have seen in basements of malls or any big buildings where they have a dedicated ducting where your parking area is so they kind of pick up the fumes from the parking area and they are exhausted out so here it's a similar principle but instead of having dedicated ducting what we do is we have our return air ducting anyway coming back into this unit so whether it is this unit or a conventional ahu it, it, the principle is the same that the return air ducting that comes into this unit instead of going into the unit the return air and then kind of mixing with a little bit of fresh air and recirculating when there is a fire alarm there is a damper which closes the passage to go into this unit and the return air gets diverted into this side duct which you see so this is an exclusive exhaust duct and uh, the way the damper over here damper is basically like a shutter closes over here the damper for this duct opens the return air comes over here and this exhaust fan also starts automatically when there is a fire alarm so your return air when it uh, when there is a fire alarm instead of going back to the ahu it automatically starts getting exhausted from this exhaust duct so this is a very important requirement which which all of you all should keep in mind what you see at the bottom is a typical um, uh, what you call as a control room or audio video control room uh, photograph uh, in this case uh, what you see over here are two main controls one is for your stage equipment which is this the black one and what you see on the right over here is the console for your audio video equipment so these are the two major consoles that you have over here in this case the projector was a part of this control room that's why you see the projector over here this is actually suspended from the ceiling if you can make out the stand for the projector is suspended 
because here the 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 space below was very tight so conventionally you can have a regular projector which is even kept on a table top or has a stand which is floor mounted in this case it is suspended from the roof <laughs> what you see at the back is a typical audio video rack so all your networking and all cables audio video cables usually terminate in the rack and then get connected into these consoles you typically need a ups room also next to your control room because uh, your audio video equipment usually needs to have a ups backup your raw power is not allowed to be connected into the audio video equipment because it's very sensitive so you need a ups room which ideally should be a small room abutting your uh, uh, control room because the ups room needs 24/7 air conditioning mainly for the battery not for the ups per se but for its efficient function you need 24/7 ac so it's better to have it next to it a separate so when we were taken first time to see the site, we were actually given the liberty to select the site that we want for the audio. So they initially wanted one audio. So that is what you see at the back of there. When this construction started, they asked us to have another 300 seater interview mainly meant for seminars and QA sessions. We built this and then they asked us to even have a separate cafeteria. So the cafeteria. So the site that we chose is actually that you see the kind of connects to the main entrance below. Most likely, I have a they all look on to this green lovely campus. So, child, the site was very appropriate since it was the prime location where you see that. So, we kind of like designed the structures also to better suit the site. And the so, this was the main auditorium. So, one of the requirements they had was besides. area where they could build exhibitions and some other kind of events for their students. So what you see here is the upper uh, areas are quite expensive and because they serve a multiple Now the other challenges of here is though the auditorium itself is air conditioned, you see, the foyer areas are not air conditioned because for institutional auditoriums typically the client will tell you that is better not to air condition simply because the running costs then go very high. So here too the fire areas are not air conditioned. But the challenge we had here was two things. One is we have this huge black facade, which is itself a very difficult uh, kind of a proposition to have in a climate like Rajasthan, which has such extreme temperatures where the summers can go 45 to 26 degrees. So we took it up as a challenge, and we were fortunate that this entire site actually faces. So this entire facade that you see is not facing, so you don't get too much of sun penetration. So that was that was a natural advantage. But in addition to that, what we did is we had we have this huge overhang. You see, so this overhang is almost eight and a half nine meters. And in addition to that, there are two other things we did. Uh, one is we, as you see, we have these glass. Uh, sorry, we have these aluminum lures at regular intervals in the glass facade. So what these lures do is they basically get in your air fresh air from the outside. And the coffered series on top in design in such a way that in between uh, at regular intervals, we have got coffers which have got skylight on top, which is raised. And below the skylight, we have got ventilation and floors. So there is a very typical what you what you are taught in college as a stack effect where your air enters from here and the hot air rises over here and gets exhausted from the top. And to kind of further accentuate this phenomena, we have a water body all along the front length of the oil. See the fountain over here. So the water body with fountains. What happens is the air that is coming in from here and gets naturally cooled because of the water over here. Then passes through these doors and gets exhausted from the top. So you know, we actually did a did a temperature calculation once the structure was built, and we were kind of you know pleasantly surprised to find that these interiors were far more comfortable than even standing under a tree outside or any of the indoor locations. So. That was one, one achievement for that. This is the plan. 
then we have got a large expansive stage. Now, though this is an institutional auditorium, the client was very particular to have all the facilities or nearly all the facilities at the professional theater. So some of the things that you see over here, you won't even find in professional theater anymore. We've got a huge stage over here with a dedicated service entry. We've got two kinds of service entries. One is a truck top and one is a ramp over here. So if you have some large kind of a, 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 something heavy that you want to get to the stage, you can actually unload it here on the driveway and pull it up on the stage and get it directly. Roll, roll it up on the side stage and then get it directly onto the stage over here. So you've got two big service entries. There's a dedicated stage store. So whatever stage furniture which is not in use can be keep can be kept over here. Because you've got various kinds of arrangements on the stage. You may be having a panel discussion one day, you may be having a drama. So there are a lot of props and chairs and tables and a lot of other stuff that needs to be kept, you know, got in, got on the stage. So having a store next to the stage makes a lot of sense. Uh, we have the back over here has got all the dressing rooms. There are basically two kinds of dressing rooms. One is a group dressing room and one is a kind of private dressing room. Reason you need to have both of these is because if you have a senior artist or a senior degree coming in attending your function, they don't like to share their dressing or personal dressing. So you should have a mix of both. Where the group dressing rooms can be used in events where they bring dances, where students or some junior artists are visiting the so they don't mind sharing their dressing. And you need to have smaller dressing rooms for seniors, senior artists, and dignitaries. The foyer area over here, as I told you, is quite expansive. The other interesting aspect over here is the chairman of uh, this institute was a very keen uh, kind of supporter of Indian dance and Indian art and Indian uh, music and basically all, all art things. So you, you see a lot of sculptures and murals and these kind of things. And these are not just basically for the, the, the aesthetic value. There's a lot of uh, kind of a you know, little bit of information if you can see is engraved at the bottom of each sculpture or each artwork, which gives you a brief idea of what kind of uh, significance of it. You've got these huge murals in the side for the 40 feet by 16 feet size, so huge murals. This again, a little bit description of the mural is given at the bottom here. So it's a kind of an education cup. Aesthetic focus both is there. The central statue is, of course, the Nataraj, which is uh, done on this, on this statue. Now, for the stage, we have got multiple arrangements. What you see over here is one of the arrangements where uh, we have got a screen which is permanently parked at the top when not required. And it can be lowered down and used for presentations. So, this is what is known as typically a presentation screen. Now, what happens with presentations uh, usually is that when you have front projection, there is a projection in front of the screen which you need to be making because otherwise you tend to cut the projection screen. So to avoid that, that kind of uh, issue, we actually have back projection here. So when they use the auditorium for presentations of like PPT like we are seeing now, they use this screen. So this screen is motorized, it is got down, and a projector is mounted on a we have, we have made a uh, portable projector stand on which the projector is mounted at the back. And is done from the back. So you can stand in front of the screen and even touch the screen without any shadow or without any, any projection. So that is one facility. When not required, obviously the screen is taken off. Then we have an additional screen which is much larger, almost the entire width of this opening, which is much closer to the front of the stage, which is used as a cinema screen. So that screen also, the entire screen is parked above the stage over here. So that, when that screen is got down, the projector in the control room is used, which is a cinema projector. And they actually show documentaries. They even show uh, some of the new movies which release uh, uh, for the country. Even those are shown here. So they've got a professional quality sound system and projection system. And that is why you see these additional speakers on the side walls. If you notice, side and even the rear wall, you see those speakers. So these are what are known as surround speakers. So surround speakers are typically required when you want to use the auditorium for cinema also. So you will see these typically in your PVRs and multiplexes when you go to see movies. These are not typically seen in auditorium, but here in, in this case, since we wanted, they wanted to use this for showing movies, we got this system also. Now, of course, you've got all the atmospheres where you are speakers in the ceiling also. Here again, the materials which we have used are being an institutional auditorium, they're very resilient. Here at the ground level, the lower level, if you see, we actually have granite. You can pick out. 
So a lot of people will tell you stone is not one of the things which you can use in auditoriums, obviously because it is not a good thing. But here we have actually used granite. The way we have used it is we have used granite in strips of about 100 or 120 mm with uh, gaps of about 8 to 10 mm in between. What we have done is uh, behind the granite there is a there is a framework, aluminum framework. And in that framework there is uh, insulation of a polar material. Material varies from the front over here to the back. But essentially, there is some amount of acoustic feel at the back. And between those glues, you've got a black colored jute like fabric. So, what you basically see is vertical granite strips with grooves of uh, dark colored grooves of 8 to 10 mm. And it's through these grooves that the sound kind of you know, goes in and uh, gets absorbed in the back. So, you can have these kind of materials also in auditorium. It's not that you need this typical uh, excuse me, sir, for the interruption. Uh, there's a little bit uh, problem from your side, sir. Uh, we cannot hear you properly. Is this better? Sir, can you repeat once again? Is this better? Can you hear me properly now? Uh, yeah, I can hear you. Is this the, the sound is coming? Is this better? Can you hear me properly now? Yes, yes sir. sir. Right yes, now, sir. yes, sir. Yeah. Can you hear me properly now? Yes, sir. Now yes, sir. I can hear you, sir. Yes, sir. Is the audio better now? Yes, sir. Am I audible to you, sir? Am I audible to you, sir? In just you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, we, are... sir. We, uh, yeah. we can hear you, sir. I, I cannot hear you for some reason. Okay. But you all can hear me, right? Yes, yes. yes we sir. are okay. So I'm able to hear you. Yes. So basically here also we have uh, the light bridge as you had seen uh, in the earlier auditorium also. The finishing that you see in the ceiling over here, uh, the white colored grid that you see is again aluminum. Uh, the black colored tiles are obviously absorbent acoustic tiles from a company called Armstrong. And uh, the ceiling panels here are again ready-made products. These are wooden or wood-based products. Uh, these are ready-made kind of uh, uh, slatted uh, uh, kind of an effect they have. And even the uh, the coffered grid at the back that you see is also in aluminum. So again, there's a lot of aluminum and uh, stonework that is used over here. Uh, this is the mini auditorium, which is next to the main auditorium, which you saw in the rear slide. Uh, here, you will notice that the seating arrangement is very different because, as I said, primarily this was meant for Q&A sessions and seminars. So we have a kind of uh, enveloping seating arrangement where people who are seated on one side can see each other in the audience. So it's a more intimate kind of a setting, which is typically required in seminars and Q&A sessions. Here again, uh, there is a provision for uh, surround sound as you, as you see the speakers at the back. Uh, here at the stage, uh, flexibility is limited. We just have a back screen over here, nothing much. And you have a side stage access over here on both sides. Here, the subwoofers actually are below the stage over here, the white ones that you see. The main area, the main speakers are suspended from the top. Uh, here, the chairs actually have writing tablets, which you see over here. So, these writing tablets can be folded and kind of placed between the chairs because they are used by students to keep either their laptops or small notebooks or that kind of a thing. Projection again is from the back over here. Here, again, we have a cinema quality projector. And here, the, the finishes are more uh, kind of in tune. 
uh, to modern auditoriums where we don't have granite over here. This is all wood. Uh, the back over here is fabric of a particular density and thickness. Uh, ceilings are again white octro acoustic tiles, but not the typical acoustic tiles. Uh, the front over here, again, as you see, is, is the same uh, ready-made wooden uh, strip kind of a finish. Uh, flooring, obviously, is carpet. And chairs here, we have got a different, uh, there is a, a molded uh, plywood back and wooden arms over here, as you can see. So you have, again, various uh, components of the finishing and the stage are labeled for your easy reference. Here again, the foil area, uh, we have got some amount of artworks. Here the artworks are different here. There are these are Indian dance forms which are shown over here with some kind of literature at the bottom what these dance forms are. In the front, we've got a sun mural and uh, a little bit of a write-up about the sun mural over here. Uh, this is a ticketing kiosk. So basically, uh, since they show, uh, sometimes they show recent movies also, uh, they, we have a ticketing kiosk in the center, so you can actually book your tickets over here and then go into the main auditorium on this side or the uh, mini auditorium which is on the left hand side over here. And in the front what you see over here is a space which is actually left vacant for a sound and light show. So sometimes they have open air sound and light shows in the campus, so that also is kind of accessed through the same entrance. This is of course the cafeteria which is abutting, which has a similar Design philosophy, but this is air conditioned, so you don't find any lures or anything over here because this is centrally air conditioned. This is G plus one, so there is a little bit of seating area on the top. This is approximately 200 capacity cafeteria. Uh, now, this is what I've done in your city. This is the BITS uh, Hyderabad campus. Uh, this was uh, again a 2500, so one of the largest auditoriums. Uh, in this was unique in, in, in a sense that. Uh, some auditorium projects you get where the client uh, themselves are not exactly sure what they want. So this was a very classic example of that, where the first meeting we had with the chairman, Mr. Kumar Mangal Birla, the only thing he told us is that I want two things. I want approximately 2,500 capacity and I want the auditorium to have what he called as a wow factor. Because he said it's going to be used by students. So I don't want something which is like a traditional auditorium which we see at a lot of places. So these are the only two things. So it was a big challenge for us to, you know, but just based on these two kind of requirements, how do we build up, you know, the entire kind of user brief? So we actually had a number of sessions with the client and we explained to them the various possibilities that they could have in an auditorium. So some, sometimes as an architect, you need to understand that you need to kind of formulate the user brief for the client. Even that happens sometimes. So you need to be well versed with what you are talking about. So here we gave them various options. We told them what are the various possibilities. And then we kind of started designing. And one of the key things that we thought over here is that uh, since they wanted some, some uh, you know, kind of a different look and feel to the auditorium, what we have done over here is the entire auditorium interior, you don't see a typical auditorium vibe where you see perforated um, you know, absorbent surfaces or typical acoustical surfaces. You don't see any of your typical air conditioning, uh, uh, either they are jet diffusers or typical air conditioning vents. So if you see here, you, you almost, you don't realize how the air conditioning is done. So to do that, what we have got is we've got a double layered ceiling. So this entire lower decorative ceiling is totally free of your actual acoustical ceiling, which is above, which is black color. And not just the ceiling is black color, all your service endpoints are also absorbed into that upper ceiling. So your air conditioning, uh, jet diffuser endpoints, your smoke detectors, your uh, sprinklers, everything else has gone into the upper ceiling. So at the bottom, other than this first row where you see a little bit, the first round of uh, your jet diffusers, which we couldn't avoid. Other than that, you don't see any services. So all the services are just beautifully kind of, you know, integrated with that unoptimistic ceiling at the top, because of which we could play around with the geometry of the lower ceiling. So the entire, uh, though the entire bottom decorative ceiling has, doesn't really perform an acoustic kind of a requirement, what we have done, which I don't know whether you all can notice, as you go from the front of the auditorium to the back, the solid mass in that auditorium ceiling goes on becoming lesser and lesser. 
So the logic is that when you have your sound point or sound kind of you know, generation point is obviously your stage area and where your main speakers are. So typically towards the front, you can design your acoustics in such a way that you have more reflective surfaces in the front. And as you go towards the rear wall, your absorption goes on increasing more and more. So you basically avoid unnecessary echoes and reverberation. So that is a principle that we have followed in the decorative ceiling. So though it may seem like just a pure aesthetic kind of a design, there is actually a thought behind it where you see the front panels, these are all absolutely solid. So there is maximum reflection over here. And as you start going back, your this grid starts becoming rarer and rarer and towards the end, we just have an open trellis. So here the absorption automatically becomes poor because your uh, the solid surfaces are reducing and your absorptive surfaces are increasing. Here, of course, we again we have a dedicated light bridge like we have in the other ones. The side ones also, though you see them as a mural, actually the side ones are planned where each of these surfaces are calibrated for different kinds of absorption. So what you see on the top over here, which are white, they are actually fully fabric finished panels which have got the maximum absorption. What you see as different colors as orange and you know, yellow and all these. These are also uh, what are known as strand kind of a material. So they are uh, again absorptive surfaces of different densities. Your entire green background is also an acoustical material. So the reason why I'm telling you this is you can actually have an aesthetic kind of a uh, design done which integrates into your, uh, into your acoustics. So your acoustics doesn't need to kind of or it shouldn't be a separate aspect of your design. Your architecture and design itself should be able to integrate the acoustical requirement. Again, we have uh, three different kinds of curtains. You've got the main curtain in front. Uh, there's a rear curtain which kind of covers the screen. We've got a big screen at the back. Here, there are there was no space to have a motorized screen which goes up because we didn't have that much of headroom. And then we've got a mid, mid curtain over here. The mid curtains are essential because when you have a large stage and sometimes the auditorium is used for a large scale event in the sense that uh, uh, you, you know, there may be maybe four or five people who are part of that event. It may be a small discussion, a panel discussion or something like that. So in that case, the to use the entire stage looks a bit disproportionate. When you're seeing the entire stage from the seating area, you, you feel that you know the people are too small compared to the proportion of the stage. So that is when you can actually close your mid curtain. So you see a smaller part of the stage exposed to the audience. And then it kind of, you know, the performance is enhanced because the stage area is proportionate to the number of people on stage. That is why mid curtain is essential. Uh, the other things that uh, are interesting over here, obviously here you have a balcony. So we've got about 2000 seats on the lower level and about 500 odd seats in the balcony area. Uh, these are the drawings to basically help you explain what I just told you. So the ceiling design you can see. So in this, you can actually see all the AC diffusers which are planned in such a way that they come exactly where the cutouts in the decorative ceiling are. So this was a huge challenge for us because our entire decorative ceiling, as you see, is in a radial pattern. And that radial pattern also kind of is, is denser towards the front and it becomes rarer and it goes to the back. Whereas your entire uh, acoustic ceiling, which is there on top, which is black colored, is basically a rectangular grid of 1.2 by 2.4 meters. Uh, sorry, 1.2 by 600. Amen. So to fit in a, a rectangular grid above a radial grid, such that you get all these uh, endpoints of your services exactly where you want was a huge challenge. And uh, acoustically, the other thing that is also important is when you have a fan-shaped auditorium like this, your ceiling also should gradually step up as much as possible. So what you see here, it is the lowest level. And as you go towards the back, it kind of starts getting higher and higher. Uh, this is the Junction Baba Theater, which is a part of the NCBA complex at Mumbai. Uh, one of the unique aspects of this theater, this is approximately 1000 uh, capacity. Uh, this was designed to function without any amplification. So you see over here, there are no speakers. So a person standing on stage and talking in a normal voice or playing an instrument is heard in the last row without any issue. So that was one big, uh, big challenge, design challenge over here. That's why you see all these sidewall panels also, they are angled at different angles. So these were all acoustical requirements. What you see here, you see here again is a kind of a decorative ceiling at the bottom, 
and the actual ceiling, which is the acoustic ceiling, which is known as a volume enclosure, is almost three meters above this decorative ceiling, which you can't see because it's dark color. So that was again an acoustic requirement. The other uh, interesting design aspect over here is the front three rows over here can be dismantled of the chairs, and this entire floor can be lowered and used as an orchestra pit. So this is a conventional full-fledged orchestra, about 140 musicians can sit over here, and this entire floor can be lowered so that obviously your sight lines from the rear rows are not affected. So the musicians can play over there and you can have a full scale of opera over here. Uh, the another aspect over here is what you see over here at the moment is what, what is known as a music shell. So music shells are done when you have an orchestra of this kind where almost the entire sound that is generated from these instruments needs to be reflected and thrown into the auditorium. That's why there is nothing absorbed or absorbed over here. This is all reflective materials. And this is the, this entire music shell is actually dismantled. So when not required, all these panels are folded and kept to the side. And you have a conventional stage with side wings and light bars on top and scenery bars on top and that kind of thing. So there are a lot of different flexible arrangements that are possible in this stage. Uh, the other interesting aspect is this lower portion, which looks like wood, is actually marble. So that is another thing where, you know, another auditorium where we have used a lot of stone where normally stone is not found in too many auditoriums. The last design aspect is having the chandelier. So the chandelier, chandelier was actually purchased by the chairman, then uh, Dr. Jamshed Baba of the NCBA. And he actually asked us whether we can have the chandelier as a part of an auditorium. Because uh, until that time, I'm not sure now also if, if you know, uh, auditorium interior has been uh, designed around the chandelier. So we said we'll not only have the chandelier inside, but we'll design the entire uh, kind of interior uh, focused on the chandelier. So you see the entire uh, ceiling plan of the auditorium, even the sidewall paneling, all kind of germinates from the central chandelier. Here again, we have a conventional light bridge. So we have got multiple uh, light uh, lighting sources. We have a light bridge over here. We have got sidewall light shots. So what you see over here are sidewall light shots. You can have light from here thrown onto the stage. We have got lights at the back also over here, which are not being used currently in this photograph, but you have got lights at the back. So you have multiple light sources which can be used for the stage lighting. Here again, you see the, uh, the light bridge clearly over here. You see these light slots and you, uh, the, over here, this is a continuous, this is a large uh, projection room. So you can have two, three different kinds of uh, mixing and sound recording arrangements down over here. So this is a regular professional grade theater. Here you can see the various uh, components labeled. This was completed almost 20 to 23 years back. That's so why the materials you see over here are not some of the materials which you find currently. I mean, now you have a lot of scope of different kinds of materials. Then, unfortunately, we didn't have too many different kinds of materials available. So the entire side walls, this upper portion wall is basically POP of different densities. So, and over here, obviously, is a metal grid where we have these kind of lights. Uh, this is the Tata Theatre in the same complex in, in NCPA Mumbai, where this theatre also has been designed so as to function without any amplification. So here you see there are, again, no speakers over here. The interesting aspect over here is this was designed mainly for Indian dance and Indian music. So the design philosophy was that the way traditional Indian dance and music was performed in very intimate surroundings. It was performed either in someone's residence or it was form, uh, performed in temples. So where you, know, you had uh, the performers very close to you and there's a very direct connect. So that's why you see the stage over here is just about a foot high, about 300 mm high. And the seating is kind of surrounding the entire stage. The other unique aspect over here is uh, the acoustics have been designed in such a way that other than the chairs and the carpet, there is no absorb absorbing surface. So you typically see your side walls, your rear walls, your ceiling, everything is reflected. So that is a huge challenge. And this is where uh, Professor Cyril Harris had assisted us in the, in the acoustical design. So we have got these tetrahedron kind of geometric shapes in the ceiling, if you see, ceiling and the wall also where alternate tetrahedrons project downwards and alternate are recessed into the ceiling. So this was a very specific acoustic requirement. And uh, the other interesting aspect over here, this auditorium is the only one in India which has got a revolving stage. So what we see on stage over here as a groove, the entire portion behind this groove can revolve. So you can have a different set ready at the back 
and during a change of event or a change of program, the entire stage can revolve and uh, the people who are at the back can kind of come to the front. So this is the only auditorium which has got a revolving stage. Uh, this is an experimental theater again in the same NCPI complex. And here, as the name suggests, this is mainly used for different kinds of uh, small scale productions where they are experimenting with different kinds of theater and dance forms and art forms. So here in this case, you see the stages toward one side, but there is no actual elevated stage, it's just a floor. Now you can actually put up a stage over here if you want. If you want, you can shift the stage to the center and change the seating arrangement on all sides. Or you can have the seating arrangement on a, a stage longer and seating only on one side. So there are a lot of permutations, combinations uh, possible over here. That is why the uh, interior is also muted because you, you cannot design an interior in one particular arrangement. So we've got basically a black toned interior where you can have the multiple seating and stage arrangements. Uh, this is uh, the JID Tata auditorium which we have done in Bangalore, which is a part of the NIS campus. Uh, the interesting thing over here is two things. One is you normally don't have auditoriums with such sloping roofs. So here we, we did this because the rest of the campus actually has this architectural grammar where we got a lot of arches and sloping roofs and these Taylor tiles or Spanish tiles that we had used. So we actually, since this auditorium was a second phase construction of the, of the campus, we decided to give a similar look to the auditorium also. Uh, so here you can see the campus, this is the faculty block in the center, on the right are residential rooms, and the auditorium is here on the left. Now the other interesting thing is this is a approximately 330 seater auditorium but with a flat floor. Because they wanted to use the seating area for multiple functions, not just a typical auditorium kind of a function. So because there is a flat floor over here, you see the stage is a bit higher. So typical ratio between the stage height and seating is the shallower your slope of the seating area is the taller your or higher your stage needs to be. That is a thumb rule. So if your if your stage is lower, then your seating needs to be that much more steep to get better sight lines. That's why typically when you see the stages of uh, large political rallies or you know functions which are held on uh, big maidans or grounds, the stage is much higher because the floor is flat. So it's a similar logic over here. Uh, this is a convention center uh, complex which we did for uh, uh, IISC, that is Indian Institute of Science, in uh, again in Bangalore, uh, where we have got a large 750-seater auditorium over here as the main auditorium, and then we have got smaller auditoriums ranging from 200 to about 50 capacity also, uh, spread out in the same campus. The logic being that a lot of corporates and a lot of uh, big companies they host events where they have uh, all their departments uh, kind of, you know, uh, attending a common session at the start of their, you know, two or three uh, day seminar that they have. And then over the next few days, various departments that you may have a packaging, a marketing, a sales department, so those guys then separate out and then use these smaller auditoriums for their own independent kind of uh, seminars. So this is very, this kind of a design arrangement is very useful for such seminars. The other interesting part over here, what you see the step seating over here is actually not the main auditorium. There is an amphitheater which is planned on the roof of the main auditorium. So instead of having just a common flat floor which you see or a slope, <coughs> sloping floor above the auditorium as the roof, we have actually stepped the roof and given an amphitheater on top of the main auditorium. The stage area below doubles up as the stage area above with the roof because the stage area needs some lighting. So the stage area is covered and the oh, seating area is kind of open this way. So these are some interior and exterior photographs of the same auditorium. Now coming on to uh, some of our current projects, either unbuilt or uh, under construction. So this is an amphitheater and a mini theater complex which we are doing in Rajasthan, which the work has not yet started, where the lower portion of this amphitheater actually is a museum for the students. So this is also for a for Institute where they wanted a permanent museum where the students' works can be exhibited year on every year. The exhibit kind of changes. And there's a mini theater at the back over here, and there's an open kind of a cafeteria in front. So this is the basic plan where this lower portion where you get additional height is a kind of a museum area. This obviously is your seating area for the amphitheater. Uh, the stage and the backstage areas where you got a little bit of uh, dressing rooms and some other facilities. 
this is the mini theater, and this is a kind of a plus shaped cafeteria with four open to sky kind of courtyards on the four sides. Uh, this is an auditorium which we are doing in Mumbai for Institute of Chemical Technology. Uh, this is uh, again a multi purpose auditorium where we've tried to explore having vaulted kind of ceiling arrangement over here. So, this is at the moment in the design stage. We are hoping this work starts in maybe a couple of months' time. This is the same auditorium. Uh, this is uh, a satsang hall which we are actually doing in a place called Dharampur in Gujarat, which is a part of an ashram of uh, Jain and Gujarati community. So it's a big, big uh, ashram of about 200 acres. And this is probably going to be one of the largest auditoriums in the country. This capacity is about 5,500. And uh, this is primarily, though it's an auditorium, it's primarily meant for their uh, you know, religious or their spiritual discourses. So the entire lower portion is a flat floor. So this uh, kind of, you know, the, the people are expected to sit on the floor. And some seniors, if they cannot sit, there is there going to be loose chair arrangements for them. And this entire uh, auditorium is designed in a circular form. We've got these four huge arches which actually support the entire structure. A very interesting structural design also. And all the entire wall paneling and the ceiling have got these baffles. So you have got a wall baffle over here, which are in these staggered form. And we have got these ceiling baffles, which has got a veneer uh, finish. It's basically plywood finished with veneer. And uh, this we are actually doing with uh, another architectural firm called Seri Architects in Mumbai. So we are the auditorium consultants for this particular project. This should be completed in about uh, next two or three months. It's nearing completion now. The balcony over here, as you can see, is a conventional step floor with chairs. But the lower seating, which is about 4,000 capacity, is entirely flat floor. So these are some of the photographs of the, this project before the interior work started. So you can just get an idea of the volume and the way the structure was designed. So you see these four huge arches, which are there, two in two directions, which support the entire uh, seating and stage area. And uh, this actually, the lower left photo is the photo of the central AHU, which we have. So the entire uh, air conditioning of the seating area is done from below the balcony over here, where all the AHUs are located over here. The stage obviously has a different AHU, which is at a higher level. This is the part of the end of the entries. So the entries to the auditorium are at these arch intersections. So wherever these arches are intersecting are where we have our entries coming to the auditorium. So very interesting uh, structural design uh, project also. So here you can get a better idea where all these outer areas are the fire areas with your toilets and all the other facilities. And this inner circle is which is what your uh, actual auditorium is. And these are the four arches. So the arches are actually curved in plan also. They're not straight in plan. So you've got these one, two, and three, and four arches which are spanning the entire structure. And this, of course, is the balcony area on top. Uh, this gives you an idea of the way the interior finishing is done. So we have got all these ceiling backers which you see on top, which are suspended from the girders. So there is a there is a deck slab on top, so we cannot take any support from the deck slab. But there are steel girders. So all these, we have got a secondary steel framework done between the girders. And all these ceiling backers are suspended from their secondary, uh, uh, secondary framework. Similarly, for the wall panels also, we have got, so this is the details of the wall panels. So the entire peripheral wall is an RCC wall. So it's like an RCC cylinder, basically. We've got this secondary framework, MS framework done from on which um, your wall baffles are fixed. Now, wall baffles have got perforations in different shapes to allow for the sound to go through and you've got your acoustical infill at the back. And all your services actually run through these uh, gap, which is there in this structure. So your air conditioning ducts run through here and then you they kind of have their outlet over here for the supply as you see over here. So this was a mock-up that was done before the work started where your air conditioning kind of uh, the, the what are known as the diffusers, uh, jet diffusers are integrated into the wall panels over here. And these are the different finishes that we were trying. This was the mock-up of the ceiling baffle. This of course now most of the work is done. So another maybe couple of months we should have the actual photos over here. This basically gives you an idea. So the entire wall paneling has got this huge MS structure at the back. So all your services, your firefighting lines, your your uh, 
sprinkler lines that is all of them are rooted over here. The sprinklers are side through sprinkler lines. Uh, this is a project, a small auditorium which we are currently working on for the Aditya Birla Group. This is in Mumbai. And uh, the interesting aspect that we are trying to kind of achieve over here is uh, this is near a place called Malabar in Mumbai, which is which is uh, one of the you know premium kind of locations in Mumbai, where one part of the hill is abutting the, um, the building which has the auditorium. And that part of the hill is going to remain as it is because that is a kind of a road development. So Nothing ever going to come up over there. So you see a nice lush green background at the top. So instead of have, having an auditorium which is conventionally, you know, everything is looking inwards, we are actually toying with an idea of having a glass back to the entire stage area. Because this auditorium is meant basically for small scale performances. So they don't want a large, you know, flexible, various different kinds of arrangements for the stage. It's going to be very small scale performances. So we are actually contemplating with an idea. We have not yet finalized this design. But this is just to show you all the various possibilities that are you know, achievable if, if uh, you want to. So here, we, this entire stage back is what we have got as glass. So you actually see this entire nice lush green side of the mountain uh, when the event is going on. But this again, as I said, is in the design stage. So we have given these two options to the client. One is this where you have this kind of a enveloping seating arrangement. The second option is where you have uh, conventional seating but stacked seating. Stacked in the sense all these rows can be pushed back and made into just one single row and this can be used as a flat floor auditorium also. So these are the two options and here we are uh, kind of toying with the idea of having a parametric kind of a design to the, to the fall ceiling. So this as I said is, is in the design stage. So hopefully next time, uh, if I get a chance to show you uh, another presentation, maybe this would be final by that time I can show you what actually we are doing. Here, of course, again, we are having the side wall, which is got the glass. Uh, moving on, uh, I will quickly touch upon uh, some of the key aspects now that as architects or budding architects, you all need to know when you start designing audio. So I'm using the Modi Auditorium in Rajasthan, which we had done, done as a reference because there we had done the structure and the interiors. So it's a, it's a good uh, project to use as a reference. So these are the various components which are labeled. As I said, the stage area is over here. If, it, if the auditorium you are doing is almost a professional grade, you have to have large side stage spaces over here to allow uh, performers and artists to wait over here for their queue before they come onto the stage. So you have to be careful of that. You can also have what are known as switch change rooms. What you see over here, these two rooms are known as switch change rooms. So many a times the, the event is such or the performance is such that the artist needs to quickly go off stage, change into a different costume and come on to the stage quickly. So he or she doesn't have adequate time to actually go back where your actual changing rooms are. So you have you should have a couple of quick change rooms over here where they don't even have doors, they just have curtains to these rooms. So the artist can just go in quickly, change the costume, see himself or herself with the mirror and come back to the stage, sometimes within a few seconds also, within a minute. So that is why these quick change rooms are provided. Then uh, this service entry is what I already explained to you, store also what I showed. There's this common service yard where your electrical room, your chillers, AC equipment, all that is kept over here. Foyers again, you have your main foyer here, side foyers. The space below the seating can be used for a choose and workshop, which is what you see over here. Because if you get sufficient height, otherwise that becomes just a dead space which you don't use for anything else. So you can, you can either have the foil area extending into the space, or as we have planned over here, we can have an HU over here also. The side, obviously, these are the toilets. This is the upper portion where you see the entire stage area, or the entire seating area, the upper, upper part of the stage. We've got some additional changing rooms at the back. So if you if you have this as a large stage and a large performing area, you need to have multiple changing rooms because you may have many, many artists kind of uh, becoming a part of one event. Now in section, what is interesting over here is the height that you see above the stage over here. So all the facilities, if you need to have a fully functional performance stage, you need to have this kind of height. So as a thumb rule, if you are this height is about X, the clear height of the stage that you see, the stage opening, which can be anywhere between 9, 10, 11, 12 meters around that area. The space above this needs to be one and a half times. And that one and a half times is up to that C grid, which I have shown you, that maintenance platform, which I have shown you. 
then above that you need to have space for one person or uh, woman to walk and then above that you have your actual structural building. That is why you see your the stage block goes that much more higher. So typically if your auditorium is going to be a professional grade auditorium or you want a lot of facilities for the performers, then you need to have this kind of a stage height. You know, the floor stepping also you can see because of the additional height you get, you can use the lower part for uh, age use. The reason why I'm saying age use is because if you have age use at the bottom, you kind of get an ideal air conditioning flow. So you can have all your return air taken either from the seating, uh, you know, the floor of the steps or from the side walls, the skirting level at the side walls. And you can have your air conditioning through from the top. So you get a natural ideal circulation for your you know, cold air being thrown from the top and getting kind of uh, sucked in as the return air from the bottom. Now, this is what typically a stage equipment uh, arrangement looks like about the stage, which normally you don't get to see. So this entire mess or the entire, you know, confusion that you are seeing is because you need to accommodate as much as you can in terms of flexibility to make your stage as usable as possible or as flexible as possible. So starting from the left, you've got your main curtain over here, which is in blue. Then you have got various, these uh, kind of purple are the light bars that you see, which are you know, labeled as LB1, LB2, LB3. Then you have a bar for the cinema screen, as I said. So you can actually have a cinema screen, which can drop down and be used as a regular theater when you are not using it as uh, for other events. Then you have these scenery bars, which are uh, labeled over here. There are two scenery bars, so you can have different kind of scenery or props. Then you have a mid curtain bar, as you see over here. Now, in this particular case, the, the client wanted a specific requirement where for their annual day functions, they wanted to have a chandelier at the top of the stage. So we actually have a bar, which is, you can see over here, which is written as chandelier bar. So we designed the bar to take weight of that chandelier. So that is used only that once a year when they have this special event, where they have a very nice chandelier kind of lighting of the stage area. So that is something which you can do. So you, this can be customized depending on your requirement. Then going towards the back, you have a cyclorama bar, which I said, which I said earlier. This is a bar where you have lights which actually light up the back of the stage, the backdrop of the stage. So you can have different lighting effects. If it's a dance performance or a drama or a music performance, something like that. Then of course you have a rear curtain which kind of closes the screen or whatever you may have as a backdrop when not. In addition to all this, there are also mic bars what you see. So you can also have what are known as hanging mics. So sometimes the performers, if they are doing a lot of you know acrobatic stuff, so they are moving around a lot, they don't like to be attached with mics. And even, even if it's a cordless mic or a collar mic or a lapel mic as it's called, sometimes they find that also disturbing. So you can actually have hanging mics on top of some parts where you can have uh, hanging mics. And what you see on the finally on the side over here are those side lights which I spoke to. Where they are they are called teleclimbers or side lights. So they basically throw light from the side. So some of the lighting effects of the event may be where you want light coming in from the side. So that is why these lights are over there. And then you need this rear passage. Rear passage is called as a rear crossover. So a person can go from one side stage to the other side stage without being seen by the audience. So this is very critical to have. What you see on the right, this is the basic grid or the C track grid, as I told you. So this entire, all these bars that this entire equipment is actually suspended from this C track grid. And then this square grid is what is suspended from your two ceiling. So what the, there are suspenders at every these two meter junctions. And this is what is suspended from your RCC or steel ceiling what you have. Now this is the same arrangement in section for a better idea. So your C track grid is over here in pink. What you see, these small green blobs are actually the drive units or the motors for all these parts. And what you see, this zigzag is what is known as the teddy climber, which you can have the side lights for. All these are your various bars. These are your light bars, your utility bars. This is the mid curtain, this is the rear curtain, and this is the main curtain. And this is, of course, your FOH light bar, where you can see a person sitting and you can manage the light which is falling onto the stage area. This is your basic calculations for your sight lines, which I'm sure you all, you all would be taught. But what is critical is you need to identify a point on stage for all the lower level sight lines. We typically take it about 100 mm from the front edge of the stage. So here the front edge is somewhere here. So from there we take about 600 mm. The logic being that no one comes 
closer than that to the stage front. No, no artist or no person who's on the stage comes closer than that. So person standing at this point, the people should be able to see the foot of the person. That is the logic. So because if, if there is a dance performance, you need to see the foot of the dancer. You, you want to do that. So you take that as one point and then you join all your sight lines in such a way that, you know, the person in front kind of sees above the head of the person sitting. Or the person in the back sees. Same logic for the balcony also. And that is why typically when you have a cross sign, your stepping over here increases because of the way the sight lines are. It's a very basic calculation. Your the, This is a preferred calculation for your uh, balcony design where if this is X, that is the uh, headroom available uh, above the person who's sitting immediately below the balcony lip, that should be X and this should be 2X. That is ideal, but in most cases, you may not be able to have this as 2X. You may need it to be more, as you have seen it over here, to get an optimum capacity. So then the logic should be that the person sitting in the last row over here, if you take a sight line from here and cross the lip over here, you should be able to see the top of the stage. That should be the logic. This is if you need to have an audio video pitch. So a lot of people call this as an orchestra pitch, which you see in a lot of auditorium. It is actually not an orchestra pitch because you cannot fit in a full scale, full scale orchestra. So this is more of a dual control for audio video systems. So when you have that kind of a pitch, it is usually needs to be sunken so that the people from the first few rows are not obstructed by the people who are uh, you know, the technicians who are sound and light technicians who are there in this pit. And a lot of people prefer this pit because the technicians over here are closer to the stage occupants. So an artist who's, who's sitting on stage, many a time they need to make some adjustment to the mic or to the monitor speakers or something like that. So it's easier to communicate if the person is sitting back in front instead of communi communicating with someone who's at the back in the, in the control room. This is typically required for larger auditorium where the control room is too far back. Now, going on to the different disciplines for air conditioning, you need to know the different systems that are available with you. You obviously have air cool, chilled water, VRF combination package. Combination package is what I have shown you in the first auditorium. Most auditoriums, air cooled is what is preferred, even though technically chilled water system is the best or the most efficient system for air conditioning. The reason why air cooled is preferred is because auditoriums are typically not used as often as some of the other areas. Like, you know, you may have offices, you may have residences, or other similar structure. Auditorium, especially large auditoriums, are not used as often. So if you are going to use a large auditorium in an institute for, say, four or maximum five times in a month, then for the rest of the days when the system is not used, it starts corroding very fast. So that is why chilled water system is not preferred. You then go in for an air cool system. <laughs> for smaller auditoriums, you can have VRF also. Combination package, what we already spoke about. What you need to be aware is your stage and seating areas needs to have separate issues. So you need to have separate uh, supply reducting, return reducting for both areas from a fire safety point of view. Ideal circulation for uh, the air conditioned air, as I said, is you can have the supplier should be from the top and ideally your return air should be taken from the bottom. And if you actually plan that properly, you can actually do away with these jet diffusers. So a lot of large volume spaces you feel that these Jet diffusers are kind of default, but you can actually plan your design without jet diffusers if you plan the circulation properly. Fire areas, as I said, typically, if it's an institutional auditorium, you should not air condition it because running costs are high. Or uh, different kinds of jet diffusers, grills, we already have seen. The DB levels or the sound levels on stage are very critical. This is not your acoustical concern, let me tell you. And the conducting of the stage has to have a different kind of insulation. Make sure that the vibration of the Supply being thrown onto the stage is not picked up by the is very good. Venting of the space above the false ceiling. So, as per NBC, if you are the dead space or the void above the false ceiling is more than 800 mm, you need to ventilate it for safety purpose. You need to have sprinklers over there and you need to have smoke detectors also over there. Uh, for smaller rooms, you should have individual ACs, they should not be connected to your central plan for the simple reason that your VIP lounges or your control rooms are many a times used much before or after the event also. Like if you have a large event taking place, the technicians, the sound engineers, light engineers start working maybe a day or two or three days before also the event. So when they are working in that control room, you should not have to put on your central system just to air condition that small room. 
So your smaller room should be independent to the condition. Moving on to electrical, what you need to be aware is your electrical system should be designed so that 100% DG backup can be given. A lot of places where there is a power uh, issue where the power supply is not very stable, you will need to provide the DG in any case. But places like Mumbai where typically power is not an issue, a lot of people, they don't plan for this DG backup, but that is still essential because if you have a high level dignitary visiting like a chief minister or a prime minister, their security protocol states that no matter what the situation is, you need to have a power backup from a security point of view. So in that case, what is done is your main panel actually at least should be designed so that a portable DG can be brought on site and plugged in for such events. At least that provision should be there. Your basic distribution of uh, electrical energy is, is as in other large buildings where you have a main electrical panel room and then smaller DB rooms are distributed throughout the building depending on how your electrical supply is planned. Fire area lighting obviously is controlled to DB, you have individual switches. 100% UPS backup is required for AV equipment, which I have shown you. Uh, LED fittings are what is the norm now. Dimming system, lighting seals are also very critical. You need to have at least two, three different kinds of dimming systems so that you can uh, use the various systems in a different kind of uh, events that you have. So if you have a QA session, the auditorium ne uh, needs to be lit up slightly because the person on stage needs to see the people on in the audience. If it's, say, a cinema screening, so the entire seating area should be absolutely dark. So you need to have at least two, three different kind of lighting arrangements that should be done. Diffuse lighting, some kind of cold lighting, and direct lighting, which will all obviously be dimmable. But these two, three different kind of arrangements always helps in these different kind of events that you have. And that is where your audio video and your stage equipment is also linked. So you can, for a particular set kind of an event, you can have a project effect to a particular, a particular setting. You can get a screen down. You can have the lighting level, the lux level set to a particular. So you can have four, five scenes set into your automation system. So you just have to press off a button that entire scene will change depending on the what your event is. Emergency lighting obviously is needed. You can either have emergency lighting connected to your UPS, which you are providing for the audio video system and size the UPS accordingly. Or you even get lights which have got their individual battery backup. So when there is a power failure, automatically those lights take power from the battery which is located along with that light fitting itself and they get powered on. Lightning protection obviously required depending on the site location and how high your building is. Uh, firefighting, you need to basically go ahead with what your fire officer of your local area stipulates. Besides, most of the areas, actually most of the locations in India, they are governed by NPC. So as I said, sprinklers are required above the fall ceiling if the height is more than 800. So seating area stage where you can provide sprinklers if they are typically height is six or seven meters because above that sprinklers are not ideal. Beam detectors are needed for large areas. So when you have a larger volume, larger height, you see these in airports, you see them in malls also. So similarly, they need to be provided in auditoriums. Your fire tank storage again is governed by your fire officer's requirement. Smoke extraction is critical for the seating area, which I spoke about in the first auditorium. Similarly, smoke venting of the stage area. So typically this the ceiling of the stage area, we have what are known as automatic uh, smoke vent doors. So when there is a fire, these doors automatically open up so that the smoke which is rising can be exhausted from the top. And stage area, why it's more critical? Because there is a higher chance of uh, fire happening there because there are more electrical, more wiring, more, you know, more components over there which can catch fire. Fire curtain is sometimes used very rarely. The fire curtain is basically in addition to your main curtain. So if there is a fire on stage, it doesn't spread into the seating area. The main reason why it's not used is very expensive. So you won't find it in too many auditoriums. Moving on to audio video systems, various combinations you can have depending on what you want to use the auditorium for. So you can have your 2.1, 5.1. So basically what it signifies is the point one is the woofer and two, five, seven are the number of speakers that you have. Then you have Dolby Atmos, your surround sound which you all we saw. So here in this case, as you see, these are the subwoofers that we have. These are the array speakers. Now the subwoofers can also be placed at the bottom of here. So it depends on your design choice and what your audio video consultant will tell you. That these locations can change slightly. The array speakers are always over here, so they need to be here for their maximum dispersal potential. These are surround speakers, which again we have gone through. You can have additional displays as what are seen over here. If your auditorium is very big, 
can have some displays towards the rear. Not a very ideal situation, not something which we recommend because the whole purpose of the auditorium is to see a live event. So in a live event, if you are going to go and then see a screen, it kind of defeats the purpose. So not very ideal, should you avoid it as far as possible. But sometimes if it is unavoidable, you can have these uh, additional displays. Projection types, again, we have seen a lot of different kinds of projection types. The rear projection is there, projection from the uh, from the control room is there. You can have cinema kind of projection projectors, you can have conventional uh, laser projectors, different possibilities. For recording, you can even have fixed cameras uh, located within your auditorium for certain definite kind of fixed recording angles. But for professional recording, it's always better to have a handheld camera because you get the best result where you have a person, you know, professional a videographer who will who can record your event. But you can still have some fixed cameras for recording your day-to-day -day events if you require. And with today's time, of course, you can have the entire control of all these systems on any tablet or iPad if you require. Stage equipment, we have seen most of these components. You got the main curtain, which can either be side parting or vertically rising. So if you don't have say, uh, space on the side to gather the curtain, you can also have the curtain which rises vertically, which is known as an Austrian type. Mid curtains, we have spoken about rear curtains, also wings is the side kind of partitions which you have at the side of the stage. Cyclorama screen is the screen at the back of the stage. These are the different kinds of lighting uh, possibilities, light fittings that you can have on top. Uh, FOH lighting is also what we have seen with a light bridge. Uh, Sidewall light slots also you show on Jamshed Baba Theatre. These are the different kinds of bars that you can have. Gobo scallops are basically stencils which you can have on the projector or on a particular light. So you can get a particular, say, a, a logo of a company or some kind of a, for some kind of a, a mural pattern or something if you want in a performance. Those can be added as stencils in front of lights or projectors. Control locations, as I said, can be in the pit right above or in front of the stage, or it can be from the control room at the back, or even from the side stage area if you want. It depends on how you want to use the uh, auditorium. In the chair design, you need to be aware of the center to center of chair depends uh, on two things mainly the capacity that you are aiming for and the kind of theater that you are designing. So, typically, if you see in multiplexes which have what around 300, 400 capacity, you can have wider, more comfortable seats of 600, 650, even 700 sometimes. But typically, as your capacity starts increasing, and when you have 1000, 2000, 3000 capacity theaters, then the seating spacing should not be more than 535. Because otherwise, your seats, your rows will go so far back that you will see the stage is very small. So that's why for larger capacity auditoriums, typically 535 is what you should aim for as the center to center for the chairs. 520 is also done, but 520 sometimes tends to become very, very tight. Then uh, basic, you have got you know, different finishes now available. You can have PU, that is polyurethane, plastic. Uh, you can have wooden arms, uh, wooden uh, seat backs, wooden uh, chair backs, the seat and uh, chair both can have wooden finish. You can have your conventional, uh, you know, the seat with, with your cup holder, as you see in multiplexes. You can even have multimedia controls if you want. If it's a smaller auditorium, you can hook up and uh, hook up a laptop over there. And you can have some USB. So USB uh, kind of uh, connection, all those things are possible. Seat numbering, eye lighting, obviously you have a lot of choice. But typically when uh, auditorium seats are designed, their absorption is designed equivalent to one person. So if you have a thousand seat auditorium, which is occupied only say 700 seats are occupied, it should not suddenly sound different. So that's why the empty seats are designed in such a way. And every seat is designed in such a way that it accounts for Absorption of one person. So when the person is sitting on the seat, obviously the person is what is exposed to the sound. So that's how it is done. Retractable seating is an option which is now available. I'll show it to you as we so some of the newer technologies which you all can explore. One of this is having these retractable seats where all the rows, including the seats, can fold up and get kind of uh, you know stacked at the back or you know particular location that you design. So this is very useful for multi-use where once this stacking is done, then the flat floor can use can be used even for sports. So a lot of foreign uh, universities and uh, colleges have this kind of an arrangement where they don't need to spend money on a dedicated auditorium and a dedicated indoor sports area. 
So sometimes they have a basketball court or they have some kind of a skating ring or something like that where the seats can be stacked to one side. So this is what you see. So this is a typically, this seems like a badminton court. So all the seats are stacked to one side over here. And when required, you can pull this out. And this can be done manually or it can be motorized. You can even have a kind of an alcove done in the back of the So when they are stacked, you can actually have a panel in front. So you don't even know that there are seats at the back. So there are various ways in which you can design it. So these are what are known as retractable seats. So these are the kind of you know, spans on which they are fixed and they can be moved. Various options you, know, you can have here. As you see, they have got basketball courts over here. So this is one of the options. Here, as you see, they can be manually operated or you can have a motorized kind of a system. Most people prefer a motorized system. Okay. Now, the other interesting development in, in uh, seating and basically stage design is what is known as flexible seating system. Now, this we are actually uh, teaming up with a company called Gala System, which is based in Canada, where they have done a number of projects in the US and Europe. The first project that they have done in India is about to be commissioned soon in Delhi Dwarka, which is called as the India Convention Center, where uh, what is possible using this system is that your entire stage floor and seating area can be customized the way you want. So this is a typical case study of one of the projects they had done in Budapest in Europe, where uh, this is approximately a 2000 seater auditorium, where if you see over here, the entire floor, each of the rows is independently supported on a piston below. So each of this row can be lowered or raised depending on how you want to choose to auditorium. And that extends into the stage area also. So within the stage is segregated into different panels and each panel is motorized. So the different arrangements that you can have over here, the main reason we are having this system is typically auditoriums are white elephants. They're very, very difficult to maintain. There's a lot of cost goes into the running expenditure. So what this company does is they try and give you as many different kind of uses as you can have in that same structure. So that your structure is used for many more days in a month than being used just as a conventional auditorium. So this is one arrangement, which is a conventional kind of a seating area, as you see, a lot of auditorium. This is another arrangement that you can have where the entire seating area is split into three segments, where each is separated by an acoustic partition. So what you see as a thick fold line here is actually an acoustic partition, which is otherwise folded in the seating on top. So this is typically known as sky fold. Is done by a company called as Dorma Kava. These partitions can be brought down when required, and the area is split into three different auditoriums. Now here, if you see the central, uh, the rather the middle and the back auditorium, you don't get ideal stage space over there. So it is not the perfect design, it's not the ideal design, but you get so much flexibility that people don't mind compromising a little bit to get that additional flexibility. So your front portion of the auditorium actually gets the bigger stage. Over there. So that is one arrangement. Then you can also have an arrangement where part of it becomes a flat floor. So everything, including the chair, kind of flips down. You see over here in the section, the chairs are actually flipped down. So you need about two and a half to three meters below your this zero line, so to speak, to accommodate this entire system. And the rear portion becomes a flat floor. Front portion remains as a conventional auditorium, stepped auditorium. Here, what you see is the stage area has increased substantially. So for some events where you need a larger stage area, where you've got more, more number of performers, your stage can extend straight up further as well as you want. And the balance portion can then become your step seating. So this is another arrangement that you can have. This is another arrangement where your entire floor is flat. So all your chairs get hidden below. And you can actually have a sit down dinner kind of an event, like an award show. Then this arrangement is where these are various possibilities that you can have. So this is the, the way the system looks like. This is the skyfold partition. So this is like a kind of a folding partition, which when brought down and anchored properly, it becomes an acoustical partition and separates out these two volumes. So this is one of the projects which they have done in, uh, in Switzerland, which is a convention center which is designed on using this system. 
these are some of the photos. I've got a video which will better explain the system to you. So here you can see when the floor is flat, when there are no seats, this is when it is full, all the seats are up. And this is a kind of a schematic section which you see the lower level also. So I just quickly go through this video so you'll get a better idea of what it is. So one of the one of the uh, kind of disadvantages or two issues that you need to understand about this system is that one is that your acoustics and your audio video performance, so to speak, is not the absolute ideal because you don't have one fixed uh, set of seating arrangement. So your acoustics needs to be a little bit more, you know, flexible. So you don't get the best acoustics for that particular volume. That is one thing. Second thing is the cost, obviously. So one of the main reasons why it is not uh, that widely used is as a thumb rule, if uh, your cost for say a 2000 auditorium is X uh, rupees, uh, for having such kind of a system, your cost at least doubles, if not more than double. There's a substantial cost impact. And uh, that is why in India, it is not yet that prevalent other than this project which I told you about in Delhi. And uh, the other fallout of this is you cannot have this if your capacity is very small. You know, if you have 300, 400, even 500 capacity, it doesn't work out. Uh, the financial feasibility doesn't work out. So you need to have minimum 1,500 seats for this to be viable. And even then, it is a very expensive proposition. So that's one of the things that you need to bear in mind uh, before you can suggest this kind of a system to your client. In fact, we have... Uh, kind of, you know, being uh, we are having a lot of sessions with Gala Systems and their technical representatives and us, we are giving presentations to many of the Indian clients. But as yet, we have not found any client who has, you know, told us that yes, let's go ahead. All of them like the system, they like the potential of the system, but the, the, the finance part of it is still a stumbling block. So there are not too many people are agreeing to. So that, that is what it is. So if if you all have any questions, we can take up some questions. Thank you, sir, for this amazing session. Uh, students, if you have any doubts or you want to ask anything, any questions? Uh, you can type it in the chat box or you can unmute yourself and ask that directly. Yeah, Rahul, I have a question. Yeah, uh, you're on mute. I can't hear. <laughs> yeah. I can't hear. Yes, yes. So it's a wonderful presentation and the um, <clears throat> the scope of... Uh, Sorry, I still can't hear. Yeah, the scope of work that you have done is uh, tremendous. Uh, yeah. yeah. One the question is the experimental uh, auditorium that you have shown in Mumbai. Yeah. yeah. So there... Uh, um, I'm sure about the lighting and all that, but uh, the audio, like uh, there are no mics. So typically like the Tata auditorium, this is also 
uh, yes, without yes, any yes. electronic uh, yeah. audio yeah, system. It is, it is, and that is why the capacity is limited. It's about three hundred capacity. Okay. So typically, these experimental theaters you can't have very large capacity okay. because then to tackle your audio video becomes a challenge. Yes, and um, uh, the gala system that you have shown, I think yeah. the possibilities are uh, very high. Uh, huge, huge, absolutely huge, yes, yes. huge, and especially for a urban setting like Mumbai or even Hyderabad, where you know uh, some of the prime areas where your land cost is very high. Yes. There it makes a lot of sense. And you obviously cannot have this system in a in a tier two or tier three city. But yes. in a place where land cost is very high, yes. just that one auditorium structure can double up as so many different venues. Yes. So there is a huge potential. And basically for universities, no, like uh, uh, that can be like the sports one and the auditorium. And exactly. Uh, so in universities, actually, we've started implementing the retractable seating, which I showed you. That yes. option works out to be more economically. Economic, yes, yes, yeah. yes. So that is more appropriate where you can use the flow, flat floor for some other event. Yes. And the infrastructure for G20, especially the Bharat Mandap and then the Nayoda, yeah. Noida Convention Center, uh, yeah. it has thrown up the possibilities. And maybe if you are looking at 2036 Olympics hosting in India, then yeah. maybe. Uh, maybe Absolutely. we can look at gala systems also. Yeah, yeah. In fact, the Olympic Committee is there in Mumbai just now. Uh. So, yeah. So, so a lot of, as I said, a lot of possibilities. The only stumbling block as far as India is concerned is the is the, the capital cost. cost. Capital. Yeah. yeah. No, but, but I'm sure I'm I'm sure we will uh, we will have some corporate or the other who will take up the cause and uh, you know put up something nice with this system. But I'm now confident that the government will be putting money. Yes. Because... Yes. Absolutely. They, are, they have vision and they, they feel that we need all this because we have to match up with European nations and developed nations. We should show them that we are developed country. True, true, very true. These are true. the places where we can show them. Actually, true. the program wound up with 15,000 capacity. It was mind-boggling. Yeah, uh, yeah. Actually, I'm looking forward to go and visit. Uh, Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> You work the Bits uh, Pilani Hyderabad campus. That auditorium is very good, and the yeah. way you have handled uh, the uh, ceiling that was uh, very, very, very creative. And yeah, very challenging also. Very challenging. Yeah. Thankfully, we we got a good set of people to work with. So, in fact, we had a local Hyderabad contractor who did the work for us. So, so okay. very nice. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> thank you so much for such a wonderful presentation. My pleasure. My pleasure. Absolutely, my And I, I think students will not have questions. You know? The reason is <laughs> it is very overwhelming for them. Well, I know, I know. Too much, too much information to take in in one and a half hour. I can understand. I and can the understand. way you have done the presentation with all the details, uh, the yeah. presentation itself was very. We try to. I mean, we try to cover every aspect so that as as students, you know, they get a kind of holistic view of the entire subject. Rather than just seeing photographs and videos. Yeah, I have a small request. If you yeah. can share some PDF drawings uh, for our students, uh, okay. we want to take some printouts and help them out with some sections and plans. Uh, okay. Whatever, if you think you can share, it's uh, okay. not an obligation. I just uh, made a request. Okay. That's okay. We'll try and see what we can share. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, sir, for this wonderful presentation. Actually, some of our students have taken, uh, uh, you know, a data center uh, for uh, their case study and for their assignment work, and it's a great opportunity for them to meet the creator. Yeah, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it was very overwhelming for them. And, yeah. uh, sir, uh, Sunil, sir, would you like to give the vote of thanks? Or... Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Rahul. And, My uh, pleasure. We will, I will definitely explore when you are in Hyderabad. Please visit us. Uh, yeah. You you know the campus. So. I know the campus, yes. <laughs> yes. So whenever you are in Hyderabad, please give us a ring. We will be very happy to host you at our school. I'll do that. I'll do that. Thank you so much. Right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Mm. yeah. I want to thank everyone who participated in this webinar. Uh, the webinar has now come to an end. On so behalf of I just want to know Sorry, there, are only, there were only two students who were absent. So, uh, yes, sir. Uh, Abhishek and Varsha, sir. Okay. 
Abhishek joined in previously, but I think he left in the middle of the session. session now. Thank you for your time. Have a good day. Thank you, ma'am.